so uh, I want to um, <laughs> I want to uh, kind of just reach into uh, SSC treatment for um, Nick set me up well as did Joe earlier on and uh, just now with Renee but when you look at the agenda you know we've had talks on blood plasma EPCR ECMO IFTs and that slide that Nick put up showed that that's like two percent or twenty four percent of our work. So what are we doing for the other 75% or so 74% of our work? We spend a lot of money and investment in that high-end, that high acuity care for patients, but actually we could do better with that money and get better outcomes for a greater number of our patients uh, with um, access to primary care. So this is the first stream, laying out the objective. It's the right care at the right time for the, for the patient in the right place. And I'm not going to go into that slide now, we've already done that, but um, why? We've got a growing and aging population. We've got patients that are presenting to us in 911 with chronic health positions, and uh, that's on the rise. And we've got higher expectations from <coughs> members of the public about what they want from healthcare. As Joe said in his presentation earlier on, demand's increasing 6% annually. We can't just keep chucking resources like that. We have to keep thinking innovatively and how can we uh, reach into uh, areas of practice that paramedics can can own and we talked about kind of paramedics filling gaps and I don't think that paramedics are filling the gaps. It's strange that these gaps exist all around the world in all the different systems and that paramedics are stepping up and uh, and doing the work but I think it was probably work that we should have always been doing and we've just never really owned it before because it's not sexy, it's not helicopters, it's not ambulances, it's not blue lights, it's not blood, it's the lower acuity stuff but that work I think is our work to be doing, and we can do a better job of managing those patients' difficulties. So, the strategy for SSC treatment refers. So, that's the broader term that we use for this project. But essentially, we're starting with patient engagement. So, we're going around with all the health authorities and we're identifying stakeholders and partners that are willing to engage with us um, where we've got patient populations in these communities to um, uh, that we can provide that care for. Nick, on his slide previously, showed you some of those populations of patients, so diabetes, falls, COPD, sick persons kind of generally presenting with uh, non-acute issues. So one of the strategies actually to get on the back of the um, primary care reform that's currently happening in BC now, we've seen the government put investment into urgent primary care centres up, uh, up and around areas of the province and we are engaging with primary care network working groups um, one of those is in Surrey right now, as well as the Community Care Network and those interfaculty teams. So the first thing that we're actually going to go down is with the palliative care project. So what it's about doing is an establishing clinical pathways that our parents can use and access that has set criteria agreed by the health authority and by those community teams so we can streamline patients into their care and use Siren, which is our electronic patient reporting software, to automatically create referrals back to those health authorities. Teams. So what's the current state in PCHS of our uh, palliative care? <laughs> Nick talked about the culture shift earlier on and you can see the picture up there. That's kind of what our approach is now. 911 calls, car crashes, let's get in there with a the fire, let's cut things to pieces and all pat ourselves on the back. But on the right, <coughs> the picture there from a, a crew in Australia who had an end of life patient who they were transferring in the facility and one of that patient's dying wishes was to see the ocean for last time. So the paramedic crew respected that patient's wishes. They drove out of their way on the way to the, uh, the IFT and uh, they stopped by the ocean for <coughs> half an hour, letting them take the views in. I was actually reading an article as well about somebody who wanted a McFlurry. So they stopped off at a McDonald's for the patient on the way to uh, the hospice as well. So right now, as we know, we've got a trauma-focused and acute high response culture. We've got a workforce that's 90% PCP or EMR. Uh, we've got people that have got no palliative education, no awareness of what palliative patients actually are. Um, and 78% of these currently are taken to the ED of the 9,000 that we've identified. Now we believe that that number is actually higher. That data has come from uh, hospital data, but we think that that could be almost double for palliative because paramedics just don't understand or know what palliative is. Um, Nick was talking about demand earlier on and how we can adjust our resources accordingly to anticipate for demand and spikes in uh, <laughs> presentations. So actually what we've got here is a spread of our demand for 
the hourly and daily breakdown of palliative uh, patients we've identified across the province. So you can kind of see there that it starts to peak around 6 to 7 a.m. in the morning and then starts to drop off by uh, 6 o'clock in the evening. So when we start looking at models like community power medicine and rural advanced care community power medicine, we don't necessarily need to be keeping people on night shift. We can actually do a better job of going seven days a week, maybe just 12 hours a day, or split shifts, six till three, three till 12. Now this, this is a figure really that makes me a bit upset because 63% of palliative patients that were taken to hospital died in the ED. And I think we could all agree that we can do better with that figure. And actually, that should be maybe 63% died in their own home, or maybe 100% get to die in their own home. So part of this project will be monitoring this and evaluating how well our paramedics engage with the community teams and how we respect those patients' wishes to dine with their family or <coughs> in a place of uh, that's been agreed. It could even be a, a hospice as well. So I want to skip this slide in the interest of uh, in the interest of time. So as I mentioned, identifying challenges to the project <coughs> majority of our paramedics are PCP licensed. Uh, and we've got to reduce scope of practice. That's the MLBD uh, legislation. Right now we've got issues around cost of medications and lack of infrastructure to support expansion. So we are looking potentially at ketamine as a part of the trial for <coughs> use of PCPs in palliative care, but as we know, we're gonna to have to put safes in stations, we've got audit processes. So there's a lot of the background expense and work to do in that, and we're not sure we can meet right now. We're gonna to have to educate and train nearly 4,000 paramedics in palliative care. So we've just engaged uh, Pallium Canada with uh, a contract for a bespoke palliative um, education program that we can deliver online for our paramedics. And um, once we get that signed, I think uh, we're gonna see a lot, of, a lot of more calls and a lot more improvement. We're gonna be called into secondary triage with the specialists around how we can better provide care to those patients. And we've also got technology barriers. You probably experience this maybe within your own health authorities, but we're finding it really hard to figure out a way in which we can share patient information through our siren system with the health authority and the community teams because we're not operating as one health system. We're operating as different health authorities that have all got different privacy laws that make it difficult to share and exchange <coughs> patient information. Recently in the NHS, they just established one system that the NHS, GPs, EDs, and parents are all on now. And just by implementing that one shared system, they've seen an increase of 15% of referrals for non acute patients because we can access healthcare records. That's not anything else in terms of practice or change or scope expansion, that's just sharing information. Uh, and we've got a lack of communication, we've got a lack of communication mechanisms like between BCHS and community and primary care teams, kind of as Nick said uh, earlier on. Some of them just don't exist. But we believe that that's part of what the government strategy is moving forward is that if we can insert ourselves as part of this broader strategy, we'll actually get a bit more traction and maybe start to access some of that funding to provide education and training for parents. So what are the key deliverables for this project? We've got to design operational protocols, dispatch protocols, create awareness and communication strategies, so I'll take that one off for today. Uh, evaluation, provide education and collaborative partnership. So only a little bit of work to get done there. Um, and this is how we think we're going to succeed. So we've been creating clinical practice guidelines. We've got strong leadership and political support. You might have seen all the articles in the news. You might have seen uh, senior leadership talking about this. We've been given a million dollars to make this work by the federal government. So um, we've got the backing. We've got to have a collaborative approach with our partners and patients. I think we're working there with that. The technological updates and the palliative care education we're working towards, we're getting there. It's required a lot of work at the back end in CAD and in Siren EPCR because Siren EPCR and CAD, as Dick said, only ever really been set up for taking patients to hospital. So there's never been any consideration or thought about what we want to do when we need people at home. What do we want to do when we start making referrals? How do we get the technology to work for us and be a little bit smarter with, uh, with those patterns of referrals? and remove that responsibility from the hands of paramedics to make it 100% reliable, 100% consistent, and 100% successful. Um, patients, families, and awareness, we've got members of uh, patient advocate teams with the quality that get on board with this project to make it succeed, and we're making sure
sure that there's a patient voice in all of the decisions that we're making. And we've got communications with the, uh, the teams post-visit as well. So one of the initiatives that we're looking at maybe using is how we can tie our community paramedic program into the referral pattern of acute uh, or even um, low acuity 911 calls for the palliative patient populations where we can maybe go around and do a visit the same day, the next day, at the weekend, or however that one is going to look. How are we going to measure success? So as I mentioned there on the left hand side, we've got uh, patients and family, they're a big part of what we're wanting to do, <coughs> but also we're looking at paramedics and the healthcare system. So how can we increase collaboration efforts? How can we identify the party patients? How can we set up communication pathways? How can we decrease transports and ED visits? And how um, can we increase knowledge and comfort and confidence and experience in that service? So whilst we're looking at that clinical aspect of how we can improve the patient's care, we also want to ensure that we can improve the patient's and family's experience and their encounter with the healthcare visit, um, because we feel that that's more important than just the clinical outcomes. This is our progress to date. So the overarching assessing treat and refer initiative, we've built internal systems to support the pathways. We are continuing with stakeholder engagement. And then once we manage to push forward with the rest of the, uh, the progress on the palliative project, we can start ticking off all the other areas. So development of education and CPGs. We will then be moving, as Renee said, to a prototype where we'll be using paramedic specialists, potentially in uh, certain areas of the province sorry, health authorities within the province where those teams have engaged with us, and um, that will be up and running uh, hopefully by August time. Um, these are going to be our standard approaches to proof of concept. So, um, as Renee said, we're doing uh, our utmost to try and identify palliative patients within the dispatch centre, and that's through MPDS or flagging them in the CAD. We have got um, clinical activation, remote or on scene. So if we've got uh, a nurse on scene or a member of the community team on scene and they are ringing in to 911, we're actually trying to divert those calls out of the CAD system as a 911 call and assign them a different MPDS code that can um, drive a different response. Secondary triage, uh, as Renee said, we've got paramedic specialists now working in second, secondary triage. They are actually working through some of these calls. They are identifying them. They are calling people back. We've equally got paramedics. Uh, I heard about one the other day. Jenny Helmer was telling me about where uh, a member of our uh, organisation rang up clinical for a palliative patient, and they just provided simple comfort measures. It was a fan. They opened the window. They created some ventilation, and that patient was. Uh, able to stay at home because they refused. And one of the biggest cultural shifts that we're trying to commit is more of a joint decision-making model where the family and the paramedics and the patient all agree that the best thing to do is to remain at home, and that we don't have to force people down this pathway of a refusal of care just because they want to stay in their own home. Uh, we've got dispatch alerts on now as well, so every time um, a special patient population calls in, uh, it will create an auto flag in the system that makes us aware and makes the clinical desk aware that we have a palliative patient calling. Uh, and then we're going to have paramedic activation on the scene, so if we identify a palliative patient on scene in certain communities, we'll, um, they can ring up and ask for a referral and then we can send the paramedic to those calls. And um, that's it. Any questions?